None of these created things reply to their questioners unless they can make rational judgments. The creatures will not alter their voice, that is, their beauty of form, if one man simply sees what another both sees and questions, so that the world appears one way to this man and another to that. It appears the same way to both, but it is mute to this one and it speaks to that one. Indeed, it actually speaks to all, but only they understand it who compare the voice received from without with the truth within. For the truth says to me, Neither heaven nor earth nor anybody is your God. Their very nature tells this to the one who beholds them. They are a mass, less in part than the whole. Now, O my soul, you are my better part, and to you I speak. Since you animate the whole mass of your body, giving it life whereas no body furnishes life to a body. But your God is the life of your life. Chapter 7 What is it then that I love when I love my God? Who is he that is beyond the topmost point of my soul? Yet by this very soul will I mount up to him. I will soar beyond that power of mine by which I am united to the body and by which the whole structure of it is filled with life. Yet it is not by that vital power that I find my God, for then the horse and the mule that have no understanding also might find him, since they have the same vital power by which their bodies also live. But there is, besides the power by which I animate my body, another by which I endow my flesh with sense, a power that the Lord hath provided for me, commanding that the eye is not to hear and the ear is not to see, but that I am to see by the eye and to hear by the ear, and giving to each of the other senses its own proper place and function, through the diversity of which I, the single mind, act. I will soar also beyond this power of mine, for the horse and mule have this too, for they also perceive through their bodily senses. Chapter 8 I will soar then, beyond the power of my nature also, still rising by degrees toward him who made me. And I enter the fields and spacious halls of memory, where are stored as treasures the countless images that have been brought into them from all manner of things by the senses. There in the memory is likewise stored what we cogitate, either by enlarging or reducing our perceptions, or by altering one way or another those things which the senses have made contact with, and everything else that has been entrusted to it, and stored up in it, which oblivion has not yet swallowed up and buried. When I go into this storehouse, I ask that what I want should be brought forth. Some things appear immediately, but others require to be searched for longer, and then dragged out, as it were, from some hidden recess. Other things hurry forth in crowds. On the other hand, and while something else is sought and inquired for, they leap into view as if to say, Is it not we, perhaps? These I brush away with the hand of my heart from the face of my memory, until finally the thing I want makes its appearance out of its secret cell. Some things suggest themselves without effort, and in continuous order, just as they are called for, the things that come first give place to those that follow, and in so doing are treasured up again to be forthcoming when I want them. All of this happens when I repeat a thing from memory. All these things, each one of which came into memory in its own particular way, are stored up separately and under the general categories of understanding. For example, light and all colours and forms of bodies came in through the eyes, sounds of all kinds by the ears, all smells by the passages of the nostrils, all flavours by the gate of the mouth, by the sensation of the whole body there is brought in what is hard or soft, hot or cold, smooth or rough, heavy or light, whether external or internal to the body. The vast cave of memory, with its numerous and mysterious recesses, receives all these things and stores them up to be recalled and brought forth when required. Each experience enters by its own door and is stored up in the memory. And yet, the things themselves do not enter it, but only the images of the things perceived are there for thought to remember. And who can tell how these images are formed, even if it is evident which of the senses brought with perception in and stored it up? For even when I am in darkness and silence, I can bring out colours, in my memory if I wish, and discern between black and white and the other shades as I wish. 
and at the same time sounds do not break in and disturb what is drawn in by my eyes, and which I am considering, because the sounds which are also there are stored up, as it were, apart. And these too I can summon if I please, and they are immediately present in memory. And though my tongue is at rest, and my throat silent, yet I can sing as I will, and those images of colour, which are as truly present as before, do not interpose themselves or interrupt, while another treasure, which had flowed in through the ears, is being thought about. Similarly, all the other things that were brought in and heaped up, by all the other senses, I can recall at my pleasure. And I distinguish the scent of lilies from that of violets, while actually smelling nothing, and I prefer honey to mead, a smooth thing to a rough, even though I am neither tasting nor handling them, but only remembering them. All this I do within myself, in that huge hall of my memory, for in it heaven, earth, and sea are present to me, and whatever I can cogitate about them, except what I have forgotten. There also I meet myself and recall myself. What, when, or where did a thing, and how I felt when I did it? There are all the things that I remember, either having experienced them myself, or been told about them by others. Out of the same storehouse with these past impressions, I can construct now this, now that image of things that I either have experienced, or have believed on the basis of experience. And from these I can further construct future actions, events, and hopes, that I can meditate on all these things as if they were present. I will do this or that, I say to myself in that vast recess of my mind, with its full share of so many and such great images, and this or that will follow upon it. Oh, that this or that could happen! God prevent this or that! I speak to myself in this way, and when I speak, the images of what I am speaking about are present out of the same store of memory, and if the images were absent, I could say nothing at all about them. Great is this power of memory, exceedingly great, O oh my God! A large and boundless inner hall, who has plumbed the depths of it? Yet it is a power of my mind, and it belongs to my nature, but I do not myself grasp all that I am. Thus the mind is far too narrow to contain itself. But where can that part of it be which it does not contain? Is it outside and not in itself? How can it be, then, that the mind cannot grasp itself? A great marvel rises in me, astonishment seizes me. Men go forth to marvel at the heights of mountains and the huge waves of the sea, the broad flow of the rivers, the vastness of the ocean, the orbits of the stars, and yet they neglect to marvel at themselves. Nor do they wonder how it is that, when I spoke of all these things, I was not looking at them with my eyes, and yet I could not have spoken about them, had it not been that I was actually seeing within, in my memory, those mountains and waves and rivers and stars which I have seen, and that ocean which I believe in, and with the same vast spaces between them as when I saw them outside me. But when I saw them outside me, I did not take them into me by seeing them, and the things themselves are not inside me, but only their images. And yet I knew through which physical sense each experience had made an impression on me. Chapter 9 And yet, this is not all that the unlimited capacity of my memory stores up. In memory there are also all that one has learned of the liberal sciences, and has not forgotten, removed still further, so to say, into an inner place which is not a place, of these things it is not the images that are retained, but the things themselves. For what literature and logic are, and what I know about how many different kinds of questions there are, all these are stored in my memory as they are, so that I have not taken in the image and left the thing outside. It is not as though a sound had sounded and passed away, like a voice heard by the ear which leaves a trace, by which it can be called into memory again as if it were still sounding in mind, while it did so no longer outside. Nor is it the same as an odour which, even after it has passed and vanished into the wind, affects the sense of smell, which then conveys into the memory the image of the smell which is what we recall and recreate. Or like food, which, once in the belly, surely now has no taste, and yet does have a kind of taste in the memory. Or like anything that is felt by the body through the sense of touch, 
which still remains as an image in the memory after the external object is removed. For these things themselves are not put into the memory. Only the images of them are gathered with a marvellous quickness and stored, as it were, in the most wonderful filing system and are thence produced in a marvellous way by the act of remembering. Chapter 10 But now when I hear that there are three kinds of questions, whether a thing is, what it is, of what kind it is, I do indeed retain the images of the sounds of which these words are composed, and I know that those sounds pass through the air with a noise and now no longer exist. But the things themselves which are signified by those sounds I never could reach by any sense of the body, nor see them at all except by my mind. And what I have stored in my memory was not their signs, but the things signified. How they got into me, let them tell who can, for I examine all the gates of my flesh, but I cannot find the door by which any of them entered. For the eyes say, if they were coloured, we reported that. The ears say, if they gave any sound, we gave notice of that. The nostrils say, if they smell, they passed in by us. The sense of taste says, if they have no flavour, don't ask me about them. The sense of touch says, if it had no bodily mass, I did not touch it, and if I never touched it, I gave no report about it. Whence and how did these things enter into my memory? I do not know. For when I first learned them, it was not that I believed them on the credit of another man's mind, but I recognized them in my own, and I saw them as true, took them into my mind and laid them up, so to say, where I could get at them again whenever I willed. There they were, then, even before I learned them. But they were not in my memory. Where were they then? How does it come about that when they were spoken of, I could acknowledge them and say, So it is, it is true, unless they were already in the memory, though far back and hidden, as it were, in the more secret caves, so that unless they had been drawn out by the teaching of another person, I should perhaps never have been able to think of them at all. End of Book 10 Chapters 1-10 to 10.